I have a creative title for a thought today. You could entitle today, One Passage, Three Principles, Two Practical Takeaways. The passage is found in Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. Matthew 14, verses 22 through 33. The Bible says this, And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray, and when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. Now let me introduce the first principle by way of two questions. Look at verse 22. It says, And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. Here's my question. At whose directive did the disciples make their way out into the sea? It was Jesus. Now look at verse 29. And he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Here's my second question. At whose directive did Peter step out of the boat and go into the sea? It was Jesus' directive. We could say it this way. The disciples and Peter are where they're at because Jesus put them there. If you're taking notes today, I want you to note our first principle today. It's this, the situation that we are in is the result of God's sovereign placement. Where you're at, where I'm at, just as with the disciples, we are where we are at because of God's sovereign placement. This is how it practically applies to you and I. It means that where we're at is no accident. It also means that where we're at is of no surprise to God. He's not scrambling trying to figure out what to do with where we're at. I have a friend who this week told me something that has just continued to really bring me joy. He said, do you know that there are two things that God never says? He never says, oops, and he never says, where did this come from? Because he's sovereignly in control of all things. Now, if you all let your eyes go back into the text, notice with me a glimpse of what the sovereign Lord does when everyone else is in the sea. In verse 23, it says, And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. You find the Lord in a state of singularity calm, and prayerful. This is the sovereign. As you and I frantically and with great panic look at everything that's happening around the world, our sovereign Lord sits calmly, singularly, in control of all things. Would you note with me again in the text something that's pretty neat? Look at verse 26 and then in verse 30, and let's take our pen and circle some words. In verse 26, you see, and when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled. There's our first word to circle. He goes on to say, saying, it is a spirit, and they cried out for fear. There's our second word to circle. Now come down into verse 30. It says, but when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And let's circle the word afraid. Let's go back into that text. When it says that they were troubled, very simply, it means that they were anxious, they were worried, they were concerned. When you see the word fear, when you see the word afraid, very simply, it means this. They were afraid. They were fearful. They'd caught their breath. There was a sinking feeling on the inside. 
there was that sense of panic. They're afraid. Now, go back to these two verses and notice the timing of something. Did the troubling, did the fear occur when the storm began or when something else happened? In verse 26, it says, when the disciples saw him walking on the sea. A great takeaway that the Lord has given me from this text, even this week, has been that there is a little bit of a difference between concern and fear. I really believe the disciples were concerned at the state of the storm, but these are weathered fishermen. These are fishermen who had undoubtedly been in storms before. They had seen waves come across the boat, but what they had never seen before was someone walking across the water. When you look down in verse 30 and you see that Peter is afraid, he had seen waves before, but he had seen waves from sitting in a boat, not while walking on the water. That placement of the fear and the troubling, I believe, is very, very helpful for us because it teaches us that there are times when we're concerned about the state of things. But what often brings us fear and panic is that something new that we've never experienced or seen before is happening before us. So, for instance, most of us have had the flu. Most of us have had bronchitis. Most of us have relatives who have been sick before. But we've never experienced this particular virus before. You and I have been at home and we have been sequestered away because of a storm or something that has kept us from going out into town, but not for weeks on end. We've seen times in which the city feels dead and nobody's moving around. But it's new for us to drive the streets of our city and see so many empty parking lots. It's the newness of what we're seeing. It's the newness of what we're experiencing that creates this fear that moves it from concern to panic. Now notice with me something else. Go back into those same verses, verse 26 and verse 30. Now we noted the word troubled and fear in verse 26, but there's another word. Note the word saw, S-A-W. Circle it, underline it. And then again in verse 30, notice it says, but when he saw, S-A-W, underline it, circle it. In both of these verses, what preceded the fear was that they saw something with their eyes. And here's where we get our second principle. Our second principle here today is this. It is really, really easy for our eyes to control the steering wheel of our emotions. If we're not careful, what we see begins to control how we're feeling. Very, very sweet, lovely friend of mine was telling me this week that they have experienced somewhat for the first time in their life panic attacks. Their breath is caught away. They, they just don't feel right on the inside. And they're scared of being scared. As we began to talk, I said, well, well, tell me, what are some of the things that happen in the hour or the two before this panic attack happens? And in each scenario, the person said, well, I was watching the news and I, I was kind of scrolling through Facebook and I just saw this and this. And they caught themselves. And they said, you know, I saw this and I saw that. And then I start to feel this way. I love what John Newton used to say. John Newton said he would read the news not to find out what the world was doing, but to find out what God was doing. You see, that first principle that God is sovereignly placing us exactly where we're at is just a reminder that he is in full control of all things. Sometimes when you and I watch the news, our eyes want to process the news and say, look what man is doing. Look what a sickness is doing. We have to be reminded by putting our eyes not on the report, but on the sovereign God, that he's in control. The placement of our eyes really will control the feelings these days. Where are your eyes today? They ought to be on Christ. As you and I look at this text, I want you to now look at verse 27. In verse 27, the Lord is walking across the water and he says, Straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. 
I love verse 27, and I love it for this reason. There's a sandwich in verse 27. A sandwich. What you see are two pieces of bread. I'll call the pieces of bread the B statements. And the meat in the middle of the sandwich is a statement about Christ. Again, look at the text. He says in verse 27, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. Do you see the sandwich? Let's take those two B statements. Be of good cheer. Be joyful. And don't be afraid. Well, what is it that brings a person joy? What is it a per, uh, that brings uh, uh, joy instead of fear? It's the it is I statement. It's that Jesus is present with us in everything that is happening. I love what one commentator said about this passage. He said, this passage reminds us that it is better to be with the Lord in the storm than it is to be away from the Lord back in the boat. Peter begins walking towards the Lord. And it was Jesus in the midst of the storm that his eyes needed to stay fixated on. And when he did, all was well. When they parted, he began to sink. Oh, my dear friend, and for me as well, my hope is that you and I would see here in verse 27 this third principle, and that is this. The presence of Christ enables fear to be replaced with joy. It's not that the storm goes away and I can finally be joyful. It's that because Jesus is here, my fear and your fear can be replaced with joy. As you and I look at this wonderful text, can I give us two practical takeaways? Here's number one. You and I need to keep our eyes on Christ. We have to make sure that our eyes are on the right one so that the eyes that are steering our emotions are steering us to the right place. You say, Pastor Ron, how do I do that? How do I practically keep my eyes on Christ? And very simply, it's a theme that has continued to come up every time I speak to us. You and I have to be in this book. We have to wade our way into these truths, and we have to just spend time learning about who God is and what God is doing. Now, as a church, I've challenged us to spend time in Psalm 46 and Psalm 91 and 1st and 2nd Peter. And I've been doing the same thing. This week, though, I added something that has been a tremendous help. As I have been reading 1st and 2nd Peter, I have added to it listening to 1st and 2nd Peter be read. As I walk in the morning, I'm listening to it read. And it has been a wonderful thing because in conjunction with reading it and now listening to it, I'm watching God put dots together for me, not of what God is necessarily doing, but about who God is. You see, our ability to be joyful and not fearful is not tied to the fact that I suddenly know why everything is happening. It's tied to my faith in the one who is doing all things well and in full control. May I plead with us again, stay in the Word. Keep your eyes focused on Christ. Now, here's our last practical takeaway, and I'll wrap everything up. Here's the question. What do you want to do when all of this is over? Okay, think about it. What do you want to do that you're not able to do right now as soon as this thing is over? As I've kind of given it some thought, there's a particular restaurant that I want to go to. They have outdoor seating. I want to sit outside. I want to enjoy a meal there. I'm even going to splurge and go for an appetizer if I can finally get there. In addition to that, I can't wait that until sports are being played again so I can enjoy sports. But of all those things, those are simple. What I can't wait for is to be back with you. I didn't realize I was a hugger until I'm not allowed to hug. I want to hug you. I want to talk to you. I want to see you face to face. Those are things that I cannot wait to do until this is all over. 
Now, notice in the text what they did when the storm was finally over. It says in verse 32, And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came, and they worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. Here's our second practical takeaway. Would you commit now, in the midst of this season, or in the midst of this storm, we could say, that when all of this is said and done, you will worship the Lord. Sometimes in the midst of the storm, we're working so hard just to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, and that is what we should do. But while you're doing that, take careful note of what you're learning about who God is and what God is doing. Take note of the way that God is answering prayers. Take note of the way that God is providing for you, both in little things and big things. Take note and, in a sense, gather a file of information that when this storm calms down, you will purposefully worship the Son of God. Today is Easter. And normally here in our church on Easter, we have special music and we celebrate the Lord's Supper and we gather together and we have just a wonderful, wonderful time of worship. And sometimes people will say, Pastor, don't you enjoy that on an Easter Sunday when we do that? You didn't have to prepare. Isn't it a much easier service? And I smile when they ask that question because in actuality, it's actually a harder service to prepare for because you have to put all of these moving pieces together even to produce the videos that we're providing for you. Just takes a lot of extra work. I can't wait to just preach face to face for the workload will actually get smaller than it is right now. It takes work to gather all the pieces to really worship well. And in this season, we have the opportunity to do the work of putting together wonderful things that we will worship the Lord for. My dear friend, I know that things are scary. I know that things are uh, tumultuous. There are waves all around us. Remember this passage. And together, let's gather our information. Let's gather our testimonies that when we're back together, we just give great praise and worship to the Lord. I've been giving a lot of thought, what are we going to do when we finally get to come back together? Those first few services when we're back together, we're going to do everything that we're missing out on right now. We're going to sing together. We're going to listen to special music. We're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. We're going to see each other face to face. But in addition to that, I'm going to give us ample time to take our voices and to worship the Lord by giving great testimony to who God is and everything that God is doing during this time. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this passage. I thank you for its practicality. I pray to be a help to each one of us. Oh Lord, I pray that you would keep our eyes fixed on you. And with your help, may we gather an ample amount of evidence that God is good, God is sovereign. And may we worship you with all of our heart. In your name we pray. Amen.